I'm so thrilled to be back again. I didn't realize, I didn't remember that it was uh, on the day of, of this um, eclipse. And at breakfast this morning at the hotel, I heard a language that I didn't understand. And I asked, because I know Spanish and Portuguese, it wasn't those, and they said, Hebrew. I said, oh, and are you from Israel? And they said, yes. And I said, well, I know the church here is just praying like crazy for you folks of what they're going through. They said they're here for the eclipse. And uh, they uh, are scheduled to go back, but I didn't, I didn't pursue that, uh, continue. But So just another reminder that as the eclipse is being seen, there's a family from Israel that's here. Uh, let me say a little bit about my early life to put the context of why I got drawn into these faith and science topics through the lens of geology. I grew up in a Christian home, so God has been my creator and all I've known is my creator since I could talk. My dad was a chemistry professor at Messiah College in Pennsylvania, and uh, he was a uh, he was also a pastor of an extension church. So as I grew up through high school, I went ahead and majored in chemistry right there on the home campus. And after two years, I realized it was time for me to uh, reach out and leave home to go somewhere else. And that resulted in my transferring to Wheaton College, finishing a bachelor's degree in chemistry. And Wheaton College made all the difference because the department chairman of chemistry there had been sending Wheaton students to Columbia University in geochemistry for years. And so I was, had the opportunity then to have that following that trend. And in fact, one of those individuals has served his career here on the UT campus, Professor Leon Long in, uh, in uh, the geoscience group. So that's a long history and that changed the trajectory of my life big time by, by the time that I'd finished then a geochemistry degree uh, at Columbia University because when I went there I had no clue about the status of where Columbia University was on the spectrum of all that. But uh, gradually learned and uh, it's just God's guidance through my life. He guided us to uh, teach at a small college in Pennsylvania for a few years, Dickinson College, near my hometown. So we still worship with, uh, at our home church from there. Went to Brazil for two years. When I came back from Brazil, got a job at a laboratory in Salt Lake City that was involved in the oil industry. And that caught my attention, and I came to Tulsa in 1981 to work for one of the operating companies that uses that sort of data from the laboratory. And then after spending, a, I'd been in it for 40 years, but in about 2000, the Lord called me into reaching out to the church with content about geology from my perspective of being a passionate follower of Jesus Christ and knowing that God is our creator because I saw the needs that are there as Hugh Ross did also many years before that. So I'm here and I'm thankful to come back again. Uh, this topic, uh, the previous topic was one sort of data about geology per se and different kinds of, it's probably on radiocarbon or something like that. Uh, today we're gonna talk about that God designed this earth for life and there's a lot of geology in that design. So that's the topic for now. The Grand Canyon is basically what I think of as creation's story, if you will, and it shows the evidence that the earth is ancient and boy, we do have a magnificent creator. There's no question about that. I love this mountain peak, that be this volcanic peak because it has that little puff of of uh, smoke or uh, above it, and of all things, I go to scripture and I read this from Psalm 104. He touches the mountains and they smoke. So God's active in, uh, in his creation in so many ways. And then learning that God explicitly invites us to study his creation. It's part of the process. 
So Job 12, 8, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. And then astronomer Johannes Kepler from the 1500s uh, did this quote as he studied creation, he recognized God in it. The chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony on that it has been imposed on it by God. Now I'm starting this time because this is uh, my professor, Wally Broker from Columbia University. And he is the one that, you know, Doc Wright from Wheaton had guided me there. Wally had in fact spent two years at Wheaton in his early career. And then once he did an internship at Columbia, he just stayed there and uh, finished there and then became a professor. And he wrote a book, How to Build a Habitable Planet, written in 1998. And I was giving this lecture someone one time and somebody in the audience said, oh yeah, when I took geochemistry or I took geology at my university, this was the book that they used. So he made that reference to me. So there'll be a couple of quotes in here for Wally. Uh, I will share with you that even though Wally had had a background in the Christian community, there was not evidence of that while I was there at, at, uh, at Columbia. And so I prayed for many years for him, for his salvation, but was not close enough to find out. So I do not know if I will see him in heaven. I certainly hope so, but that's between him and God. Multiple books have been written by both secularists and Christians about the ways this earth is unique. There's one called The Rare Earth, written in 2000. There's one Alone in the Universe, written in 2011. And then now I'll come to the ones written by Christians. This is uh, Guillermo Gonzalez and Richards. Of the Privileged Planet in 2004. They said, and they built the case in their book, the universe is extremely fine-tuned for, for the earth for, to have life that is here and for discovery. I was really amused when an amateur astronomer that visited my own church because he was there on a display with some exhibits and he said, you know, God has put us in a bedroom with a spectacular view of the universe. And it was significant because our Earth has a transparent atmosphere, which is rare of big planets. There's our solar system, and you'll notice that the solar system that includes the Earth is a little bit between some of those arms that have more concentrated solar systems and stars. And so we have basically space, you know, clear, transparent atmosphere to look out into space. And as you've heard from Hugh Ross and others, the Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across in terms of its size. Another by Hugh Ross is the improbable planet, 2016. I really enjoyed the way he put that together because each of the chapters gave details, description of how the earth became humanity's home. One chapter was on the construction materials, if you will, you know, the nature of the earth. Another chapter was on the right, right neighborhood that we are in the solar system and then where our solar system of the sun is in the uh, galaxy. He described the foundation of what we have that we're living on, you know, the continents at that point. The air conditioning in the sense that God has designed the earth to have a very stable climate now for the last 10 to 11,000 years, because prior to that, North America and Scandinavia were covered with two miles of ice for the last glacial period that gradually melted away between 15,000 years ago and 11,000 years ago. And he ultimately then made it for uh, occupancy and now has given us this uh, 11,000 years of good climate to which, as you, we all know, humanity has grown to eight billion, seven or eight billion people on the earth now. 
Um, the book of Improbable Planet, 2016, describes God's divine nature that is quoted so nicely in Romans 5.20. We have a magnetic field that protects us from life, which I'll describe here. And we have plate tectonics that keeps this life with suitable conditions in the way that it regenerates nutrients for the marine animals to live, which I'll step through. And it helps maintain a suitable condition for life with that. Hugh Ross's recent book, now published last year, Designed to the Core, uh, is another where in this book, 12 of his chapters concentrated on astronomy, which of course is not my field, so I got lost quickly. But he does have five chapters on the Earth and the Moon, and I'll be sharing some of the things now with the Earth and the Moon that he has in that book. Just to give you a little sense of astronomy, I have a few things because they're fascinating. Um, the John 1010 project is a movie producer and videographer in California who produces fabulous movies, but he also produces short eight to 10 minute videos that come online that he distributes to his email distribution. And it's worth watching because I get one of his announcements maybe about once a month. And I mean, you know, whatever he touches, bumblebees or, you know, butterflies, <laughs> it's just incredible to see the handiwork of God. In the astronomy, he put one together that included a computer model of the universe that we have something like two trillion galaxy clusters and the first part, those first 12 chapters of Hugh's book covers these kinds of things and it just blew my mind but there was way too much for me to absorb. What I did learn, which was really fascinating as we step through some of these, is that we are including here a segment of where the heavy elements came from because in the initial conditions of Genesis 1-1, when the creation event occurred as a big flash very quickly, of course the popular community, it's the Big Bang, but a friend of mine in Tulsa said, there's no bang about it in the sense of, we think of that as a bomb, and a bomb exploding is, is random chaos. This was a highly, highly organized event of the big flash when God created in Genesis 1-1. And the first step of creation was that of the initial material, the first elements were hydrogen and helium. It was about 80% hydrogen, and about 20% helium. None of the other was there at right at the beginning of those first minutes or hours or years. So where do the others come from? Well, it comes from nuclear burning in stars and supernovae. Now, my geochemistry, I did get this portion at Columbia University in terms of the nuclear burning producing the heavier elements. And nuclear physicists, of course, produce those elements in particle accelerators to learn about their properties. So there's hydrogen burning, helium burning, carbon burning, and explosive nucleosynthesis. Again, there I have that wording from my friend, the big flash of Genesis 1.1. The sun is basically hydrogen burning into helium but it has all the other elements that are, have been formed that make up the Earth. It has those also, because our sun is not a first generation star. The Big Bang was about 13.8 billion years ago, and our sun is either a second tier or a third st status star in terms of the timing. Our solar system was formed about 4.5 billion years ago. And so that in that intervening time, supernovae were happening 
producing heavier elements and blowing them out into the space wherever they were. What astronomers have learned and geochemists have learned, nuclear physicists have learned, that in red giant stars that are close to their end of life, if you will, of burning, are made up of kind of onion layers of helium burning near the surface, carbon burning deeper down, and apparently even have cores of iron and nickel. So there's a lot of heavy elements in those, in those, um, in those red giant stars. When they burned up the amount of energy that they have and they come to the position of the end of their life, the core collapses. It's a collapse of that massive star. There's explosive nuclear burning into the heavier elements. That blast wave ejects all that material out into space. And then there's lots of new elements that are then part of the next generation of stars. This one I had no idea back in the days of graduate school, but this comes out in Hugh Ross's book. Of all the periodic table that I showed you a few moments ago, Hugh says, and of course he's referring to astronomer, what we know from astronomy, if the solar sets, if the, if, if the universe were slightly less massive, the nuclear burning process would only produce hydrogen and helium. <laughs> now, don't ask me to understand that, because that's way over my pay grade. <laughs> but I just say, wow, that's all that would be there. So here's an incredible piece of fine tuning in that the expansion of the universe is governed by this mass density and what Hugh refers to as space energy density. So it's incredible. All right? Astonishing degree of fine tuning. And this is even a secularist which is saying, who is saying, this is the most extreme fine tuning problem known to physics. There you get it from an atheist, okay? So he knows that. The periodic table, if the Earth were slightly more massive, okay, this would be the periodic table. There'd be no hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen for us to, to build our bodies. There's probably some, uh, no, not, not even silicon and, you know, all the phosphorus and all the other stuff that goes into it. So that's incredible fine tuning. So here's what Hugh writes in chapter 9. The sun appears to have no twin. Among the hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, none possess all the specific features required for advanced life to exist. Thanks to its mass, its age, its unique interior structure, and elemental composition, the sun maintains its luminosity with five times greater stability than any other known star. Currently, its flaring activity level and emission of dangerous radio radiation fall below that of any other known star like it. These optimal features, along with the sun's optimal orbital position around the center of the Milky Way galaxy, holds major significance for the, portion, for the possibility of life. So, incredible fine tuning. And even atheists, as we'll see in numbers of times, know this. So God has exquisitely fine-tuned the earth for life. Here's from Paul Davis. Scientists are slowly waking up to the inconvenient truth. The universe looks suspiciously like a fix. Paul Davies, British physicist. A super intellect has monkeyed with the physics. Fred Hoyle a cosmologist. God and the astronomers, Robert Jastro, who's an astrophysicist. Astro's, ja, Robert Jastro was the head of a NASA unit in New York City, close to Columbia University. So we as geochemists and some others say from the uh, Columbia group would go hear some of his lectures. 
And I was able to do that. And I heard his lectures. Of course, not knowing that I would be quoting him here like 45 years later. And in his book, God and the Astronomers, written in 1992. Now, I was in school back in the 60s, so he wrote that book significantly after I had been hearing his lectures. But now think about him working through this process between when I heard him and now what he writes in 1992. For the scientist who has lived his, by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountain of ignorance. He's about to conquer the very highest peak, and he pulls himself over the final rock he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been there, sitting there for centuries. Can you imagine what humbling it was for him to apparently write that at the end of that book? So secular scientists know that there's something out there that they cannot describe. They basically, from my frame of reference, God is telling us there without excuse can they can tell from Romans 120. When I read this also I think of a geologic feature. It's called Devil's Tower. So as I was reading it I'm thinking of Robert Jastro, you know, climbing up that thing and there at the top of the flat top of it. Now climbers climb up there. In fact, two of my friends from Columbia University actually went out and climbed because they were climbers and they got me into a little rock climbing north of New York City at a spectacular climbing location. So, as we've said repeatedly, as I've said repeatedly, God has designed this earth for life. It's astronomy background, there's geochemistry background there and the origins of the elements and about them. Now, digging in more to geology and geochemistry evidence that the earth is Fine-tuned and unique, I'm going to talk about the Earth's magnetic field, plate tectonics, water, and the Earth's atmosphere. Successively, we'll start with the Earth's magnetic field. There are the elements, hydrogen and helium. I'll make comments about iron and nickel, and I'll make comments about uranium, thorium, and potassium. The big question, a big question is, how is the Earth's magnetic field generated? The interior of the Earth has a thin skin of plates on the top, then the mantle, and then down in the yellow in this, that's the core. The inner core is, it's the outer core is liquid and the inner core is solid. And there's some of the temperatures there on the slide that give you an idea of the temperature just at the outer core, say below the mantle, 4,400 degrees Celsius. <laughs> That's hot. <laughs> so the mantle down there in the lower part of the mantle, there's silica alumina rocks down there with other, with, with the other elements, but they're up at close to 4,000 degrees Celsius. It is not solid rock like we see out here. It's, it's uh, rock, but it has some mobility because of the temperature. So sort of think Play-Doh. I don't know if geologists sort of have a sense of what word best describes the fact that it can move, but there's plates move because there are convection cells from that heat transferring from the outer core to the mantle. So there's the context of the significance of iron and nickel. The outer core that's yellow here is the liquid form and includes iron and nickel in, uh, in, that, in their composition. The inner core is considered basically solid iron. I don't know, pure iron, or maybe they understand some other things, but it is solid. And then there's a word we use for the mantle called somewhat plastic, okay? that has magnesium, iron, aluminum, silicon, oxygen, etc. 
Now, the significance of the uranium, thorium, and potassium, those isotopes are the long half-life radioactive elements. And the point is, God included this earth being formed with the right amount of those long half-life radioactive atoms to have the interior of the earth molten because smaller planets don't have a molten core. So it is the outer molten core that triggers electric currents that then come into the magnetosphere that basically cause the dynamo to exist. There are currents of iron in that outer core and the convection in the Coriolis force that's generated because of the rotation of the Earth and those moving electric currents uh, generate the magnetic field and you can see the magnetic field lines and you can see one, mantle, one, one sort of model of the way they think about the generation of the magnetic field because of that molten core. Here's a slightly different uh, example of it that the Earth's dynamo today has that migration in the outer core and then the lines of the magnetic field. And here's a third example of the way phys geophysicists wrestle with the issue of what's happening down there, how does that dynamo move around and have its forces and, and, and strengths and shape and all those things, what's happening to keep it going. Another big thing about it that I don't get in today is the magnetic field changes in strength. It's not just solid and fixed for history. It has gone through getting weaker and weaker and it actually flips its polarity from the polarity today, which is normal, and flips polarity and reverses it such that the north magnetic pole is down at the south. So again, lots of complicated physics that are hard to understand. And over the last 200 million years, there have been a couple hundred, maybe 200, I think I counted 200 or 250 transitions of changing polarity from normal to reversed and reversed back to normal. And these have become incredibly powerful tools to help geologists understand what things happen and although that it's not, I don't have slides in this talk, that is a significant reason that the whole geoscience community recognized that plates are moving as they are and being driven by plate tectonics, which has been learned over the last 50 years. Why is the magnetic field critical? It deflects harmful, harmful solar radiation and galactic cosmic rays from hitting us here on the Earth and damaging our DNA, okay? And it protects the water that is in the atmosphere from being blasted away and being stripped off by that solar wind. Those are important because we have water here. That pathway shows the manner in which there's the Earth, the magnetic field, and then the solar radiation coming in from the left there, solar wind, and then it's being deflected around some of that solar radiation does get down into the North Pole and the South Pole. So for the example, you've heard about the Aurora Borealis and all those fabulous lights that you can see if you're at the right time in northern Alaska or in northern Norway and just incredible displays of beauty when the, when the solar radiation interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. So is the Earth unique on this? The Earth is the only terrestrial planet with a strong enough magnetic field to protect life from damaging radiation. Bingo. So the answer to that question is yes, it is very unique. Now we'll step to the topic of plate tectonics. I'll start first with the Pacific Ocean Basin. And there's the band of the Emperor Seamounts and, or, excuse me, of the Hawaiian Islands and the Emperor Seamounts, how have these been formed? Well, down in the mantle, there is a hot spot that has been generating lava that spews as a plume up through the lithospheric and crust and builds the islands. 
And there, say if you will, recently there was the continued eruption in 2018 of Kilauea. So the big island of Hawaii was being built bigger and bigger uh, through that. Then in the past, several million years ago, the previous Hawaiian islands had been formed in a manner that I will comment about here in a moment. Plus, a lot of those emperor seamounts that are basically volcanic mountains, but the crust, the crustal plate, the Pacific crustal plate, slowly subsided as the plate cools and the nature of that Pacific plate crust. And so those submarine mountains are still up there, which we call seamounts. So you'll see the ages that are on here are ages that come from the potassium argon radiometric dating method and the 2 million and the 4 million are the range in which the four or five major Hawaiian islands are. Of course, Hilo, Hawaii, uh, the big island, of course, is current. It has a radiometric age there. Uh, one that I show in some of the slides has 400,000 years. So it's the recent one, and the others are a little bit older. Now, the point is, this whole series of islands and seamounts has a very regular increasing age the whole way up to the Aleutian Island chain up by the Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula and the end of the Aleutians. That pattern is fairly straight and over that 3,700 miles the average movement has been about 2.9 inches per year. Well, what drives the process of plate tectonics? I mentioned it a few minutes ago. It's the very hot, liquid outer core at something like close to 4,000 4, degrees Celsius that triggers the step to heat up that plastic mantle causing convection cells similar to what happened in a laboratory if you take a beaker and fill it with water and use the Bunsen burner to heat the middle, the warmer water is going to rise and then it has to sink around the sides. The mantle rock is being lifted up because it becomes less dense with all that heating and then it eventually sinks back down in cycles. This is triggering the separation of North America from Africa over a 180 million year time period that I'm going to show, and it ends up producing new, fresh, oceanic, basaltic, crustal rocks continuously over that time period. And that's where those magnetic reversals played out that could be detected and confirmed. And the science community came to that full understanding in a premier meeting of the American Geophysical Union that was my first year of graduate school at Columbia University, 1967. So I was there at these, the, at a very significant highlight, sort of a summary of, finally, the science community has accepted the fact that continents move. Um, then, because of my activities getting involved with faith in science, once we had published the Grand Canyon book, I was going around and I was attending each of the annual meetings of the major geological societies to have them aware that this book was published, available for the people that they know in their communities that were sort of in that young earth mantra because of their, because of their church environment. And of all things, I was in New, Helen and I were in New Orleans in, nine, in 2017 which is the 50th anniversary celebration of that 1967 meeting in Washington, D.C. So I was there, and I heard some of these scientists who were back there in 1967 and how, what their reflections are today of that 50 years. And one of the interesting questions was, in what kind of time period did the lights come on that you realized that these plates had been moving all this time? And they often said, because there is lots of data, there's 
you know, there's, I could easily write out a list of about 10 items that demonstrate that the, this has been happening, but for now, it's, I'll just comment it about the magnetic field. They just said, well, we've been collecting all this data for, you know, these 50 years, or for the previous, the, the previous uh, 30 to 40 years after the war, and uh, we finally realized the puzzle fits, the plates are moving, because prior to that, there was a different geological model. For, for us, in geosciences, it was truly a paradigm transition from one paradigm of understanding the Earth's crust to a brand new paradigm of plate tectonics. And it was a big, you know, from the sciences, it's one of those major discoveries of the 20th century, for sure. So there's Pangaea 180 million years ago, and I'll just let it play to show how it, it has developed. So I show you that cross-section of the Atlantic Ocean Basin that happened over about 180 million years, and then it showed also India crashing into Asia, which has formed the Himalaya Mountains and caused marine fossils to be high up in the mountains. And overall, that separation, if you calculate the uh, distance and the time, works out to about one inch per year. And uh, I, I, I found in this slide, actually, they said this is confirmed that this is continuing today because it's measured by satellite. So, now let's step to the life in the oceans. That requires carbon, calcium, sulfur, phosphorus, and nitrogen to thrive, and they must be there. But as the plankton and corals grow constantly, those nutrients are being removed down into the sediments. So it's depleting the ocean of those nutrients for these species to live. So that gets buried down in the sediments, but then eventually an erosion then of the rocks up in the continental surfaces are delivering the nutrients back to the ocean. And in the ocean, then they're used, go into the sediments, and they get recycled back into the circle. So here's a interesting context of uh, the, uh, this paradox of trying to understand it. The tectonic recycling of oceanic and continental crust holds the key balanced against the continental, the continual and massive loss of minerals to the seabed. Tectonic recycling replenishes the oceans with continental runoff by the reaction of water with upwelling magma at the mid Atlantic at the mid ocean ridges. This is uh, from author Michael Denton. Uh, in a book called The Wonder of Water. So these are examples. So, plate tectonics promotes biological productivity, which I've described. It promotes diversity, which is a hedge against mass extinction. And it helps to maintain uh, equitable temperatures that we have because of a, of a property that I'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, Brown Tree and Ward, Rare Earth, those are secular scientists. It may be that plate tectonics is the central requirement for life on a planet, that it is necessary for keeping the world supplied with water. So people are understanding it. Is it unique? Earth is the only planet in our solar system to have plate tectonics. So, that one we can put a yes behind also. Now to water. Four requirements for uh, the planet to have liquid water and sustain life in that the fact that the planet has captured a large ocean. The water has migrated, say, from the Earth's interior to the surface. The water has not been lost into space. And, of course, it exists as a liquid that we know. So, from Wally Broker, have, How to Build a Habitable Planet, he highlights these. So, the Earth is habitable zone where the liquid water is possible. Only Mars might be. So, as one of the leading geochemists that's lived in the, la in the, in the last 50 years, this was his take. 
And here's what he wrote. The earth is about one half of 1% by weight water. The factors that lead to this particular capture efficiency are not understood. Based on the observation that the earth is depleted in potassium and other moderate volatile elements, our continent, our planet would not be expected to have any water. Somehow earth just got the right amount of water to support life. So there is elements of mystery of how we have so much water. So that's still need for more research, whether we'll figure that out better in the future, maybe unknown. Part of the factor of Earth is a proposal about what's called a frost line. And this comes from the two Christians, Guillermo Gonzalez, in, uh, in their book. An important concept, the snow or frost line beyond which volatiles, mostly water, condensed and remain in solid state as ice. In the early solar system, the snow line was between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So again, one of these things that further out Jupiter and the rest of the planets, any water would be ice because of temperatures. We're in a Goldilocks zone distance from the sun to have this equitable temperature. Here's one proposal for the solving that water mystery. He's free to put it that way, that we don't know too well. The origin of Earth's water is debated. The inner solar system was too warm to have retained water ice, and ice. So terrestrial water is thought to have been supplied by hydrated minerals that originally formed in the outer solar system and then in some manner migrated inward. So those are things that are wrestling with. And of course, any science always has questions to wrestle with or there wouldn't be science, okay? Is the Earth unique to not lose water over time? For sure it is, because unlike Mars and Venus, it has retained its water. So it comes to a yes, very unique again. Last topic then is the Earth's atmosphere. For the atmosphere also, we are at a Goldilocks zone in terms of properties here. The air pressure of the atmosphere has to be light enough to allow evaporation of water from the sea oceans, but heavy enough to destroy asteroids that come in and come into the Earth and the vast majority of asteroids that are small, of course, get burned up really quickly and we see shooting stars. A few come through and hit the Earth and they become notable uh, areas of study and to find out about. So it's evaporation that significantly drives the water cycle. So that thick, heavy atmosphere that uh, is protective of the asteroids coming to hit. In this Goldilocks zone of gravity, it has to be strong enough to prevent losing oxygen and nitrogen off into space, but it has to be weak enough so that hydrogen can get off into space because with all the hydrogen that uh, was here originally, say, as the accumulation of our solar system. Uh, it's flammable, so if there were hydrogen in the atmosphere, it won't last long. It's going to be burned up. Both the Earth and the, and the Venus are massive enough to hold all but the lightest elements. The Moon and Mercury have insufficient gravity to hold any gas, so the Moon has no, ga has no atmosphere at all. Okay. Now let's look a little bit about the early phase of the atmosphere. The Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago. Volcanoes spewed gases. Gases included hydrogen sulfide and methane and probably 2,000 times the amount of carbon dioxide that's in there now. Here was the composition of the early atmosphere is what's considered. The nitrogen was there, carbon dioxide, water, hydrogen sulfide, methane, ammonia, but there was no free oxygen at the beginning, okay? It was so dominated by carbon dioxide. Now, there I've highlighted that the plate tectonics process that I showed you from the slides got started about two and a half billion years ago, right there in the middle. And then before too long, cyanobacteria that were, that were growing we're beginning to use carbon dioxide and produce some free oxygen. So you can see kind of in starting maybe 2.7 billion years ago, there's a low amount of oxygen. 
and it gradually gets greater and greater as photosynthesis continues to produce uh, from carbon dioxide, produce more oxygen through down time. There, from where I now put that yellow vertical line, you can see that the, about 600 million years ago, the oxygen level in the atmosphere jumped up from something low up to toward its present at about 20%. So that's also coherent with the explosion of life that happened at the beginning of the Cambrian period with its age of about 540 million years ago. So those things hang together in that once there was free oxygen in the atmosphere up at reasonable levels, then animals could grow and live. The composition, oxygen has to be high enough, greater than 17%, to sustain biological re respiration. Uh, it has to be low enough so it don't get, doesn't get too high to prevent some uh, explosivity and potentially some toxicity to life. So there's a balance in between. Ultimately, this 21% is reasonably optimal in terms of the sweet spot that we have today. Nitrogen is about 78%, argon 09%, oh, and um, the others a uh, tenth of a percent. Nitrogen is very unique in terms of another gas in that it has the proper density. Uh, it is a non-greenhouse gas, so it doesn't absorb radiation. It can absorb uh, ultra-low UV. It is not toxic to life. It's not flammable. Uh, it's hard to liquefy. It takes a very low temperature. It is uh, non-reactive, it's, uh, non it's not acidifying, so it has a low sol solubility in water, so it doesn't move from the atmosphere into the water and be used up in something else. So it is usable for living plants and animals, so they need a little nitrogen, but it's not major, it's rather limited. Now this combination then of plate tectonics and water helps to be a global thermostat, if you will, moderating our climate in this, in this case today, at a level that is basically 10,000 years of, of very habitable climate around the world in a reasonable way. When it gets hotter, there's more rain, there's more weathering that's taking place, and that causes carbon dioxide to be removed from the atmosphere and the earth cools. If it gets much cooler, there's less rain, there's less weathering, and then carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere and the earth gets warmed up. So it's in this balance. It's a convergence among the plate tectonics, the carbon cycling process, that with, a, uh, with the liquid water in the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and it's as a greenhouse gas, it's kind of the mix is a global thermostat that keeps our temperatures within a reasonable range. So again, the last bullet point for the, is the Earth unique? We have this strong magnetic field, we have plate tectonics, we have large amounts of water, we have nitrogen and oxygen atmosphere that supports kind of life, and then this global thermostat. So yes, the Earth's atmosphere, bingo, is, is a yes. This gentleman, to my knowledge, is not a Christian, but look, listen to what he said. The earth was blessed with incredibly good fortune, giving it all the right properties to sustain a complex and beautiful biosphere. Earth is a very strange place, perhaps the luckiest planet in the visible universe. Well, of course, for us as Christians, we don't think of it about lucky. We know who's behind it. Indeed, God fine-tuned and designed the earth for life. So I've sought to present these geological features that it is unique. Indeed, and I acknowledge publicly that this of my talks comes at that Casey Luskin, who has been with the Discovery Institute for 10 to 15 years, uh, another geologist that's a Christian in the, in the, you know, the faith and science community, he showed me his version of this talk, so a fair bit of what I've done, 
put here about the water in the atmosphere, I received from him and give him those thanks. Dr. John Milam is a, is a RTB scholar, and he's written a whole big batch of material that makes the earth fine-tuned. And you can see all the articles that is written as an RTB scholar. That John 1010 project that I mentioned earlier, uh, that videographer put together about a 10-minute uh, video that came to me by email, and he included the fact of the things that I've said. We have liquid water, we have the correct type of home star, it's an optimum distance from the sun, it's an optimum rotation rate, it's an optimal position, position in the galaxy, it has a temperate climate, we have a dynamic geology, we have a large moon, we have an ozone layer, we have tidal movement, we have, uh, we have oxygen in the atmosphere, we have chemical nutrients, we have protection from meteorites, and we have protection from solar radiation, and we have the mineral resources, and we have, we, we have moving stars. We have moving what? Moving clouds, there's the word, <laughs> okay? I know Michael Strauss has spoken here before, uh, as uh, John told me, and uh, he wrote this book, The Creator Revealed, which you've heard about, and I have it just as a reminder, and for me, I found it was very good for homeschool parents. I was once at a, home, a homeschool convention, and when a, uh, a mom asked me what's the best book to start with, I directed uh, them uh, to, uh, to Michael's book. For since, he quotes here then, those, here's the Romans 120 quote, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and godhood. So they are without excuse, and that applies particularly to all those non-believing astronomers and physicists and cosmologists that I mentioned to you. Does the science conflict with biblical Christianity? And Michael says, it is so clear that the science community has overwhelmingly accepted the creation event, the Big Bang, which I call the Big Flash. Thank you for your attention so much. Okay, thank you very much for that. So we will uh, keep our eye on the clock and make sure that we're, we're wrapped up by 11.40, uh, 11.45 at the latest. So, uh, do you want to have some questions real quick? Hopefully, uh, please. We can get those going. So, uh, two rules, as we always have. Please, especially with the limited time that we're going to have, make sure you ask your question. If you need to set up your question with some commentary, then please feel free to do that. But please don't go on and on and on and on with commentary and, and not have a question. Uh, second rule: I'm the president. I get to ask the first question. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'm actually going to ask two questions. Uh, I'm going to ask one question that came up yesterday when you were talking to students, which I think would be good for the students here. And then I have my own question. So uh, you mentioned that uh, our planet is the only planet in the solar system that has the uh, magnetic field and plate tectonics. So the question came up, how do we know that? How do we know that other planets don't have that? Second question, I have read about the uh, reversing polarity before. And I understand that there is a signature that confirms that. I can't remember what that is. I, I'm curious if you know what it is, the signature is that has, that has uh, convinced us in regard to that reversing polarity. Two questions. So the first one was, first one you should have left me answer that the right magnetic away. Magnetic field and the te plate tectonics, how do we know that other planets in the solar system don't, don't have, have them? Uh, our satellites that have traveled out to the various planets can detect the fact that if there were, if there were a magnetic field. So, because the magnetic field, you saw the, all those, those lines of the magnetic force do come out into the atmosphere so it can be tech detected. Okay. So that's, that, that's, a reason, that's that reason. Okay. And then the reverse and, and then the reverse in polarity. I don't know if by key you mean... Signature. It leaves evidence. Yeah. The, the physical evidence is that 
an igneous rock, okay, that is formed on the earth now, so, such as those basalts that have been formed over the last 180 million years, the iron minerals that are in that liquid orient themselves in a magnet. So think of rocks as having little magnets in them. Maybe that, that'll help to say. Now, I don't know what that quite looks like in the rocks, but the point is, uh, I'll use the, the uh, sort of analogy that, yeah, think of some of the minerals as being small magnets. If that is a liquid, those small magnets can just move around in all directions. Once that rock turns to a solid, those magnets are frozen into that orientation in the rock. So then, as we go out and find the rock today in its orientation, we can tell if the magnetic field was normal or reversed with that piece of rock. Across the Atlantic, the, the ship that I was on, the Conrad, as we were steaming along, we had four or five different pieces of equipment that were running all the time. And one of them was a magnetometer, and the other one was a gravimeter, measuring the gravity and measuring the magnetic field that you could detect up on the ship, even though the oceanic crust was X thousands of feet deeper. So it was the geologist that began to plot across the Atlantic so they get signals, and so they plot the data so that if it's normal reversed, it's like this. So at the middle of the Atlantic Ocean Basin, it's normal. You come out a distance, and then the, the, the magnetometer detected reversal. So then that signal dropped down. And then when it came back to normal, it would come back up. And let's say there's a longer period of normal, and then went down. So that's a magnetic tape developer. And if I have time, I'll flash to one of those, but let me, just, let me go through other questions and then show that later. So the record across the Atlantic, and that was the data that was shown in that 1967 because you could take a transparency of those magnetic reversals from the mid-ocean ridge to Africa and North America, and you could take a, you could take a transparent version of it and flip it over the other way, and oh my gracious, they matched. Okay? So it's a magnetic recorder. Excellent. Now, in addition to that detection, we can go out and find rocks on the land, anywhere, volcanic rocks that have solidified, and we can measure the magnetic signature that gets locked in there, and we have radiometric ages as to when that occurred. So the geologic time scale, we show examples. We have columns of the geologic periods from now back through the Cenozoic and the Mesozoic. And in some of our graphs, we show the changing from normal to reverse, normal to reverse, normal to reverse because of that combination. So that's the marine basins, and then basically on, based on thousands of measurements of igneous rocks around the world. Mm -hmm. So that's, if, if that's, what, that's what I would call the key, if that's what you're thinking yes, of. Yes, that was excellent. You're getting the right, that was a great answer. OK. <laughs> so as a follow-up to that, just real quick, do you know how the young Earth scientists interpret that data? How do they explain uh, They don't, <laughs> period. They, the lead gentleman that refers to the magnetic field shows the magnetic field, going back a little bit of time, and he shows about three or four squiggles, and then he just shows it goes up like that, because somebody years ago said the magnetic field has a half-life decay of 1,400 years. And that in itself means exponential decay and we can measure the data over the last, uh, the earliest data detected of the magnetic field that's measured was about in the 1840s or something like that. And he doesn't even go back to the time of the last reversal. They just said, oh, the decay has happened at 14 
100 years half-life. Um, if you project that back in time, the Earth would have a super neutron star magnetic field that nothing could live. Um, and I guess the politest way I can say it's all speculation and poppycock. I don't, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, quick comment first. So, uh, first of all, we missed you, John, last meeting. Um, me and Lacey. Um, it was anarchy and chaos without you. So, there is a power vacuum, so we created more rules, okay? The third rule is that the communicators talk to me gets to ask the next question. <laughs> <laughs> And Go ahead. And I'm going to create a fourth rule that there's no limit to my comments that I could add to my question. <laughs> then it goes well, so we'll, we'll work on that, that rule. But quick question. Um, every so often the news points out that there is, uh, they found a planet that might have the conditions that we need, that they found something out there that's like that we're not rare after all. So that comes out and is projected as, as Earth's shattering news. So how would you comment on yeah. yeah. Now, I'm not the best person to answer that. Hugh Ross is a lot better. But the little bit of reading that I do, uh, they, they are able to detect the evidence of what they call exoplanets. So they can see, apparently, the change of the amount of light that, comes, that we can see from the Earth if a planet is rotating around. I guess that's one of the ways. Uh, Whatever level of details additionally they can have, I'm not quite sure. But Hugh, I, I think I'm clear and confirm with this, John, please, that who would say the best we can know it is just really unlikely that there would be a, of those exon, exoplanets that have been discovered of, oh, I, I shouldn't even give a number whether they've, think they've seen, they've seen evidence of a hundred or a thousand, I'm not sure. But they don't think the properties would be suitable. But go to the RTB website, I would say, for that one. My, my understanding, the latest I read, is that we've been able to detect over a thousand planets. That, okay. My understanding is that none of those have been considered Earth-like planets at this point. Yeah. Because our technology isn't at a point where we can detect those. Detect that, yeah. Uh, we detect planets through the wobbling of the star, it takes a massive planet close to that star to cause it to wobble. Yeah. And so uh, I don't think that we detect an Earth light. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Great talk. Um, since we're considering starving a big part of the world to stop making CO2 and um, take control of all of society for the same reason, um, does your specialty ever weigh in on the relative effect of our CO2 production with uh, solar flares, cloud formation, the change in solar output, uh, and everything else as far as the strength of these relative effects? Uh, Hugh Ross had, would have a sense of the change of solar output. And he describes it as incredibly stable. He's also written a book about climate. So for that part of the answer, please go, you know, the solar output, please go to Hugh. The carbon dioxide, my advisor, Wally Broker, was one of the lead people that recognized that the additional carbon dioxide is going to heat up the Earth. And um, when I went into graduate school, the concentration of carbon dioxide was about 330 parts per million. Uh, a few years ago, it passed 400 parts per million. And Wally Broker has written about climate change, and he describes in uh, one of his papers or a book about that topic, he has drawn a caricature of a, of a, of a tiger, okay? Or a, or a, a big animal, a, a ferocious animal. And he sees mankind there sort of back at the hip of the canyon, poking his hand into the butt of the, of the, and you don't know how he's going to respond. Now, we see Antarctica, the Arctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet are 
melting. Sea level has been rising about, and I don't know, something like a quarter of an, uh, quarter of an inch a year or something over the last. It's, it's risen over, over several hundred years by a few, in, a few inches, very few inches. So it's nothing like the vice president years ago that said things would be flooded in 20, 30 years. That, the lie there was the time frame. But slowly sea level will rise because the ice that's there got there because seawater sea had evaporated and precipitated forming those. In fact, when the ice sheets were on top of all of North America and Scandinavia, sea level was lower by 400 feet. Okay? And then it recovered, came back to this level about 11,000 years ago, but now this, the rise is going slowly. Um, and so climate change yeah, is serious. Um, Wally Broker, when I heard him talk actually at Wheaton College, he came back for a, sort of a 50th anniversary celebration or something that I went to because he was my advisor. And he just said eventually the humanity of the oil industry or somebody's going to basically, you know, we're paying a cost, if you will, that um, we're burning all this, all this oil, all the, all the biosphere, and turning it into carbon dioxide because that's the changes of climate are not 100% all mankind, but it's just like an extra blanket, if you will, on, on top of the already established process of solar radiation that's reaching the Earth. So it's rising very, very slowly by comparison. Yeah, but bird eye. OK, um, my young Earth friends always say something about the marine life on top of Everest. It's uh, as an evidence it's because it was created or uh, was formed quickly. I heard you mention one word about the marine life in the Himalayas. Would you mind uh, expounding on that one? Yeah. Thank you. I opened one of my other talks here because let me say it, and then, uh, and then once we have question, questions, I'll also begin to look at that. Um, the marine life, well, I showed you the, I already showed you the animation. I'll show that, I'll play that again. Okay? It breaks away from the south, it crashes into Asia. That's what caused those marine fossils to be up on the top. Another question. Um. Let me, let, me, let me answer that one first. Um, repeat it real quick. You, you changed, lost my thought. Reconciling the oh, biblical, biblical record, yes. Reading, reading Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was out form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters, okay? And God said, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, whatever, day one. So to me, clearly, the creation event of Genesis 1-1 was before day one. At an unknown time in the past. And in fact, John Lennox has gone to Hebrew scholars and said, created in verse Genesis 1-1 is past perfect tense. Now, I can't argue tenses of Hebrew. I don't know. But if we write it, if it is, 
In the beginning, God had created, had created the heavens and the earth. So that's one factor. The young earth community rolls Genesis 1-1 into day one when a third grade reading of the verses comes before day one. And the rhythm of days is always, and God said, like God is, is answering. And then, in day one, he called the light day. So the word day means light. And the earth is such that it can be light all around the earth because God is outside. The other thing is, several of the days, well, my wife asked, my dad asked my wife, who'd grown up in a younger church, says, how did you know there were the days on the first three days? There was no sun in the sky. And she had lived her life to the time we had gotten married and never thought about that. So those are God days to me. The other thing is, day, day six, is it? Adam was created. Adam named the animals and did a lot of other activity. So it doesn't lead. To me, the sense of day and evening and morning is, is not the way the Hebrew, even the Jews today, a day is from evening to evening. It's not. So the word evening, grammatically I understand, can mean the ending of something. And morning then is the beginning of something. So to me, a re and I have an article that's written by a, a, a Christian uh, a biologist who comes to this and he says, those are long periods of time and then the evening represents the ending of that one period of time and morning, the beginning of the next period of time. So that's where I'm comfortable with it. Just to piggyback on that before we go to our next question, if you all recall this past January, we had an intellectual dialogue with an atheist author of a book and, and the two of us dialogued together. In February, a scholar from the Institute for Creation Research is going to come down and we're going to dialogue on the young earth versus old earth interpretation of the Bible. So just keep that in mind moving forward. So you had a question about climate change. Um, I, I understand that they, they're seeing in ice cores that the concentration of carbon dioxide doesn't really match with the idea of climate and I guess global warming. Have you heard about this? No, because the, the warming process is the carbon dioxide that's up in the atmosphere, not what, what's discovered from the past. We have physically measured on the big island of Hawaii, there's a detector, and it's been measuring the carbon dioxide uh, continuously uh, for, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years. So carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere. Here's the, uh, here's the video, the answer to the uh, Mount, Saint, um, Mount Everest. Um, seashells in the top of Mount Everest. So whoever answered that question be watching this. Who, a who asked the question? Please, here's your answer, okay? Watch India crash into Asia. Boom. Now, I'm going to step over here because I want a point, okay? 50 million years ago, there's India is still pretty far south as the migration put up. And this is oceanic crust that's in front of it. 30 million years ago, it's moved closer. This is going down under. Those are marine sediments. Those are sediments on the south shore of Asia. They're sitting there, okay? I have it listed in the slide, marine sediments. Today, we find India and those sediments have been pushed up onto Mount Everest and they're there today. And there's a picture of some of the sedimentary layers. Now, I showed this to a young earth creation person in 
um, Multnomah Seminary in Portland, and she accepted a chance to have breakfast together. And when I showed that video, her eyes just popped open. So that's how fossils get up on mountains. My trip to Portland was worth her response. So that flood carried those up there does not fit with what we find that we have a physical process that uplifts mountains. Excellent, Jim. I think we're going to cut it off there. Thank you very much.